I first want to say that it is very clear that practice um, allows for emotional regulation because the reptile part of me wants to scoop right outside that, you know, get, get out of here as I get out of here. I was sitting there just thinking, you know, and said, that's you. I thought, oh my goodness gracious, it is me. Right? So my first response was to flee, but here I am. So I can, I, I'm dem demonstrating practice by not fleeing here and, and being, able, being able to actually, I hope, cogently speak with you. So this, this topic was suggested to me um, on, on a con contemplative pedagogy in the 21st century university. So here we are at a university. And these institutions, of course, will, be, will, be, will morph and change in ways that I do not fully understand. So let me first say that the, my conception of what, what this is is, is kind of, they're, they're, it's exploratory, of course. <clears throat> so it's not um, a sense of you know, what these are. I think that the kind of dooms, the doomsday kinds of moments of like, that there's the, the, the crisis of higher education. There is, there are crises, but there are powerfully beautiful things happening in, in higher education and they're demonstrated right here on this campus. So I want to say that first of all. And I would also like to, for you to take an opportunity to just look around for a moment. Like look, this it's a kind of this stadium scene. Look, look behind you. Look around, <clears throat> and this, this is what, what was said about the bringing together of all these institutions, disciplines, but not only that, community members. So the community of SUNY and the communities that surround SUNY are all represented here in a very beautiful way. I thought we could take a moment to uh, wish each other well. So you can, if you feel comfortable closing your eyes, some people don't feel comfortable closing their eyes in a group of people. <laughs> That's okay. So if they close your eyes, you might think, no. I, I get that. So these are kind of like, these are, these are offers, you know? They're, they're like, they're, they're, they're offers to you. And you, the offers can be accepted, rejected, counter-offered. You might close one eye. I don't know what you'll do. <laughs> But if we can, if it, it's, what's nice about closing eyes for me is it kind of allows me to get a better sense of my interiority that might not be true for you. So just have a moment to look around. And just, my, just to take a moment to look around. And then maybe just select someone silently. Don't make it odd. <laughs> uh, like, <clears throat> And wish that person well. May, may, you be, may you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be safe. Free from danger. May you have ease of well-being. May you dwell in loving kindness. May you be happy. And then, with a kind of ease, extend that to everyone. Everyone in the room. Just like that. May you, may you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be safe, free from danger. May you have ease. Ease of well-being. May you dwell in loving kindness. May you be happy. And my 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 
wish for you is you, you don't come out of this meditation. But remain in this meditation. And that essentially is the agenda. That is essentially the research agenda for these institutions. An agenda of wholeheartedness, of seeing not only our students but ourselves as human beings, embodied beings with all what we bring and to welcome all that we bring. Welcome your whatever you bring, your dis-ease, your ease, whatever it is you bring, to welcome it here and to honor it here by having that be the center of our interaction, mine with yours and yours with mine, a creation of a space in and amongst us and to honor that space in and amongst us. So what I wanted to talk a little bit today is basically that moment embedded in our institutions so that they can be environments of the nurturing of the wholeness of our humanness, of our embodiedness, and our interactions with one another. So we can develop a sense of meaning and have that meaning flow, not a kind of deadness, but an alive flow of meaning, such that the interactions and the, the knowledge that we partake and give can be a way in which we can live out that meaning in engaged ways amongst ourselves and in our larger communities. That's why it's so beautiful here that there's so many different groups here today. It's a modeling of that very, of that very sense of togetherness. And this process, this kind of thinking, is certainly not, you know, just suddenly like we popped up here today. So here's a, some of you might have seen this before, and if you have, you'll see it again. <laughs> so, so it's like this is the kind of, the, you know, the kind of, who, who wrote this? Now, I, off, I don't use PowerPoints much, so I often, when I do them, I kind of read them out loud. So I understand you can read, but I sometimes do that. So if I do, I already apologize. I don't use them very much. I wasn't going to do a PowerPoint, because the first one was going to be like 100 people. So I'm not going to use a PowerPoint. Then she said, well, there's, there's 150, there's 275, there's 400. I thought, I better have something. So, so, <laughs> so, do I, so, so, just to, just like, you know, it is holy ground. And that those words, we, I always try to tell my students, like, take, unlike how we often write, take the, this author at his or her fullness, each word they really meant. They meant holy ground. Okay? That's Whitehead in 17. Now you could, of course, many of you are education professors who could say, 17, I can go back you know, 300 years and we could see this. That is the point. That is the point. That this has been recognized over and over again in situations across ways in which people interacted with one another, in training, in ways in which we are trying to develop human beings. Education is a kind of building, right? It's a way in which we provide each other a way in which we can grow the wholeness of ourselves. And I think that the, the way in which that wholeness is, is operating is becoming more and more clear that it's having profound implications for the students in which we are working with. The data on this is, 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 is vast. There's just one, one example of this. 
This is, I think this is, a, this is a profound piece of datum. The students with whom we are working are increasingly stressed, increasingly, and they, they, and they recognize it. And it's not like, well, what's wrong with these youngsters today? There's a kind of wisdom in it. There's a wisdom for a variety of reasons. And I think what we, what we, what we can do is indeed prepare our students well with vocational training. Yes, we need to, we need, there's a job market. There are skills that our students need. And yet, in that process, they, we need, we have to treat them as whole human beings for them to be at the center of their own educations. And, our, and as we do that, to put ourselves in the center of our own teaching. This is not simply for students. It is ourselves. We can't, we can't, we can't pr provide a meditation in the morning with if the, the, this, the meditation, if he was just reading, okay, so just blow your breath. You know, just like the reading, you know, like just there was the, the, the embodiment of what we're speaking about is as important as anything else. So this is about ourselves and our students. This is about our staff. This is about our colleagues. This is about the institutions themselves. How do we, how do we respond to this so we can, in fact, work with the emotional health of the individuals we're working with, one of the clear ways is working with our own emotional health. The institutions themselves thinking about the emotional health of ourselves, our staff, the institutions, the, the sense of well-being and the, and the fostering of that well-being in the institutions. So the institutions themselves foster that sense, not, excuse me, simply in classrooms. So this is, the, this is the, this famous survey. This is based you know, in 49 years. Students and their needs. And of course, every time we have students' needs, we have faculty needs, staff needs, administrative needs. This is something I think is very, a very important conclusion from Gallup polls, from other polls on, on longitudinal studies of students that engagement in, within, in the work that you're doing here is a function of good work quality later on, work quality and well-being. And this last piece is actually pretty important, care and support. You know, one of the ways in which mindfulness interventions in schools are important is simply the care and attention that mindfulness has with other individuals. One can imagine I would have, one of the research kind of protocols should be what are other ways in which care and fostering takes place between teachers and students. Mindfulness is one of them. But think of what if you think of what's actually happening with this with the with a teacher and their mind, their students and their mindfulness, what actually is happening? A lot of care, a lot of support, a lot of what? Contact. And you know that's true because the, the, the protocols for that mindfulness-based intervention, if it's done by a rote kind of reading off a reading off a schedule, will have very, you know, will have my this is my judgment, very little impact. So how, one of the agendas should be, how can we think about the embodiment of what we're speaking about and what difference that makes? One of the embodiments, one of the ways in which care and support takes place is through mindfulness, through nurturing a mindfulness in our students, but also the way in which we embody that mindfulness with our students. Care and support. Care and support matter. Again and again and again. You could see like the longitudinal studies. Some, someone who took an interest in me. You'll hear that again and again. So this, this, is, this is one of the pieces of thinking about like the nature of students' needs and our needs and how we interact is part of what we need to think about in our research agendas. What is that relationship? Not only on student outcomes, 
but on this kind of second person intervention. What is occurring in and amongst? The individual providing the protocols and the students themselves. That piece needs to be attended to in very clever ways in order to find out what exactly is happening with respect to any intervention with respect to a particular kind of mindfulness. So I think just you just know that, right? You're, so, you're around certain people. I don't know if you've ever been around John Kabat-Zinn. Just feel better. <laughs> like, John, what would you do last night? It's like, he just tells you. It's like, oh, I do feel a lot better. You know, like I feel, feel less stressed. You know, I feel a little less depressed. I feel pretty good. It's just like, it's just, you're going to be, it's just the way, there's a way of being that matters. This work does that. So that this is part of what we need to be thinking about. What is the role of the practitioners with respect to these outcomes? And the nature of the outcome is much more, needs to be much broader, and it is, and the work we'll see later today. It's, there's profound work being done on, on this kind of sense of outcomes as a much broader sense. And this is, if this, is, this is also being seen in very in profit-driven firms, right? Google just to try to look at, like, wait a second. Some teams seem to work. Some teams don't seem to work. And it doesn't seem to be based on, like, who got 800s on their SATs. Because they all got 800s on their SATs. <laughs> at, at Google, you're walking around there, walking around with their little apples. Those guys are pretty rootin' tootin' on getting 800 on their SATs. But they don't know, some of them don't work well with others. <laughs> what, what is working well with others? Wait, that turns out to matter. Not, I'm not trying to fold everything we're talking about into a narrow instrumentality. But it's kind of nice that, that it, is, it turns out that that instrumentality is also really going to be, we're going to be able to foster something that really is beautiful and meaningful. And it's going to have tertiary, I would say tertiary effects. Maybe they would say main effects. But it's going to have profound effects. It matters. We matter. And how we deal with one each other matters. It matters what are we cultivating. I think one of the things we need to really t talk to our students about is why do other human beings matter? If you really ask that to students, they don't really have a good sense. Why are we, you know, they're pretty much, my students are economic students. So maybe you have a view about them. You know, but they, but they, they're pretty instrumental. You know, it's kind of like, what is justice? It's to stop me from doing something bad. So I'd say, well, so if you could get away with something bad, would you do it? <laughs> Probably. Like, yowza. You know what I mean? Like, that's like, so you know, that, that's, so this, this kind of, this kind of, by the way, in my, in my evaluations, I'm always told, like, you go into tangents. OK, so it's I'm taught since 1988. It's always happened. So I just figure I'll just keep doing it. The, 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 you know, this, this, the, this notion is, I think, is, is critical. That we, that we, you know, we need, we need to have this sense. And um, I, I think that the... The, the way in which we see not only that this, that we have these teacher relationships, but when students leave, what they report is like a lot of what I needed to learn, I learned outside. That's troubling. <laughs> That's troubling because it's costing us as a society a lot of money. And you might think, oh, economists. Oh, he's talking about money. Yeah, I'm talking about money. I'm talking about what could be done with that money. We have, we have, you know, we have Flint, Michigan in a crisis. But Flint, Michigan is a, the tip of a particular kind of iceberg. There, is many, there are many, many, many communities that same problem. We have problems that need attendance. And the way, way in which we're going to allocate money matters. And we are spending a lot of money. We're spending a good deal of money on educating young people. I think that's a great thing. However, are we doing it in ways that, that make the most sense? That seems to be a very important question. 
And if this, you know, some of the skills outside of school are being learned outside of school, and, you know, and, and, and by the way, if you're going to say, no, 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 it doesn't matter, I teach people how to think, you know, ah. Like, like that, that, that is not going to go anywhere. Enough of that. Enough of that. They already, they know how to think. Well, I teach them how to teach, and I teach them how to think in a particular kind of way. Stop it. <laughs> That's why, that is why the liberal arts are being really pushed aside so strongly because we haven't articulated well, why should there be one? What we need to articulate powerfully why it is that the ground of an ethical ground frame for how people will work in the world, a way in which institutions like this, environments can be environments where students engage in a sense of what's meaningful to them, the tools for them to initiate that, initiate that inquiry and to sustain that inquiry so that they can live in congruence with that meaning. Because if they act in ways that are counter to what's meaningful to them, they will harm themselves and they will harm others. That is the ground of what the, we should be doing. We should be doing that, that very thing. I sometimes, you know, like I said, I talk to my students about why do other human beings matter? They really don't know. Basically, it's because they, they give me stuff that I need. What if they stopped giving you stuff that they need? Then they wouldn't be useful anymore. Ouch. It's imperative that we start thinking about ourselves in this wholehearted way. So we have relationships with one another ongoingly in the, this moment, in the moment when we're teaching biochemistry, economics, poetry. I mean, we, you know, this, I just kind of rattled, these aren't, these aren't T-H-E challenges. You know, these are, these, these are the only ones. I've come up with a, with a list. That's it. But just kind of just here, here's, oh, here's a, kind of just to start a list. The, this, I mean, when you look at this, you know, like the, the, these, these, like, we really will have to train our students, not only in ways of like the technical ways to deal with these problems, but the emotional and psychological means to work with these issues. And look at them. Each of them require global thinking working with others who are not like ourselves, working with our own sense of internal biases, working with a systemic organization hell-bent on many of these to remain. So this is going to require an inter, intra, and systemic organization. So the research agenda that we have in order to think about how we need to move forward has to, it has to, it has to be predicated on an internal sense, a kind of way in which what are the, what are the tools for an exploration of this interiority, this interiority, not as, if, not as distinct and separate from you, but this interiority. Then with that, and with that, and as that develops, it's clear that this interiority is not completely separate from the energy fields all around this as it works. <laughs> so then it, be, it immediately pairs like, wow, what is this interrelationship? It, it opens that. So these practices, the practices of contemplative or mindful, or whatever you would like to call them, are initially at the center, interrelationships. They're interrelated. And then once that occurs, it's like good heavens, good grief. Those, that, in, that interiority is sitting in interrelationship, which is in a system. And the way in which this, this manifestation hits this system is profoundly different from the way in which you do, or you do, or you do. Recognize that, 
pop. That opens up a whole new kind of way of thinking. You start from there and white privilege and questions of other kinds of ways in which intersecting ways of oppression can form can be kind of talked about in a way of like, wow, of course, rather than like, what are you talking about? You say, you know, rather than a kind of like defensive, like get, get, get me out of here. It's like, of course. So the, the research agenda is we predicated on a, a way in which we start, we have the, the, uh, the, the base of a kind of in, a, a reflection, an exploration, inquiry into the interiority, interrelationship, and systemic, those three. So this, this, this kind of mindfulness movement is not a, not a removal of the world. It's not like I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit over there, close my eyes, leave me alone. <laughs> and whatever you do, be silent. And when I'm done, I want you to ring a bell. <laughs> oh, not any bell, a bowl. I want a bowl. I want a bowl with a little clangor. And I want it to come from a little store where it smells like patchouli. <laughs> that's what I want. Now, if, 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 that's what, if that's what you like, totally cool. That I think the issue, the kind of like yucky yuck part about it is like that would be the only thing that could happen. It, how will we, how the research agenda will be, how will we work with others who are interested in that exploration of interiority, interrelationship, and systemic work? We, we have some of the, we have one way forward a very profound way forward that we'll see pr unbelievable work. It's what we're going to see after this afternoon. But it's one among many. And one of the things we are trying to do at the center, slowly, is speak to others who are doing this very work. How do we, how, how best do we do that? With our, and by the way, not for our students, standing here, this bizarre moment where I'm standing talking to you about contemplation, right? Rather than just being quiet together. But, you know, how are we going to work for a real agenda where the tools we're bringing can be worked with others so that we can make the kind of change we want to make? So that we can really foster the ways in which our students can directly interact with these kinds of challenges. These are profound challenges. You look at the second one, poverty and equality. I, come, I, I teach at Amherst College. You know, students said, we've, you know, we've, done, we've done a lot to, to provide grants for students to attend college that wouldn't be able to otherwise afford it. And a lot of our students are pretty privileged students, I would argue. But they recognize that as the gap between those that have and those that don't have widen, falling off that precipice is deeper and deeper. What does that do? Makes them very anxious. Makes them think like, as my, I have a student who in her, she was like in November of her freshman year, she's applied for like 16, uh, um, uh, apprenticeships for the summer already. Got to have them. Like, like, kind of like a desperate. Rather than kind of like saying, what's wrong with them? Why are they so kind of vocationally oriented? It's kind of like the, mo the compassion moment is, I know why. Because it's very hard. It's very, very hard. So we have, we have part, part of our agenda will be to how can we hold our students in that place, in their desperate, ang anxious sense of, I got to do something that means, I, not mean something, forget all this meaning stuff, forget wholeheartedness, I got to get a job. Yes, I hear you. Hold that with, and the wholeness. And I don't think, personally, I would rather not go with, and if you do this, you'll actually get a better job. I'd rather not go there. Now, it might, be, it might turn out to be the case, 
But I think we can do something, we can do something more fuller than that. Hold our students in the compassion. Let them talk about, for example, that anxiety, that sense of what they're, what they're doing, and honor them in that rather than chastise them for that. Let's see what, what, what time is it? So, you know, these are, these are some kind of thoughts around this, what, what are we going to need? What are we going to need for this? The good news is, the first one is, is interesting, right? The first one is really that higher education kind of has a monopoly. If you want to be, you know, the manager of a gap, you probably have to have a college degree. Or if you have a college degree, you're more likely to get that job. So we have these things. We have accredited, we have accredited institutions that provide a piece of paper that enables people access to all sorts of jobs. Without that, you can't get one. The number of jobs, the number of places that require that are increasing. Now, what do monopolists do? Do they cut costs? Do they charge higher prices? Hey, wait a second. Huh. We have to be very, very careful. Now, I know <laughs> most of you are faculty members, so you're going like, to you know, throttle me mid-sentence. We have to be really clear how we're organizing our institutions. Because we have, we have the ability to be less than efficient as monopolists. And in fact, we, there, will be, there, will be, there will be attacks on that monopoly from for-profit institutions that will take advantage of this. Trump University. Now, this, this process, this process of engagement can be done in a variety of ways. If you think about Bell Hooks and her work, I think this quote is really kind of encapsulates a lot of what I'm trying to say. This knowledge-rooted experience, but the, here experience writ in a variety of ways. Here, about personal experience in a relationship and systemic shapes what we value, shapes what we value. That is a part of what we need to be providing. And as a consequence, how we know what we know, as well as how we use what we know. This is about engaged action. Mindfulness, contemplation in education is about engaged action. Engaged action congruent with meaning. And the contemplative, the mindful reflection, inquiry, are ways in which students can identify and foster that sense of meaning so that they can act in ways engaged with that sense of meaning. Now, the, what, the ways we're going to think about this, and there are many, there are many ways, but the way, one of the ways we're going to think about this are contemplative means. And by that, I mean, broadly, practices that support focus, discernment, awareness. They could be very analytic kind of meditations. They could be open meditations. They could be, they could be focused on with lots of judgment, no judgment. They could be a variety of activities that explore the internal the relational and the systemic. They, that, that process of reflection, that process of, of, of the examination of those can be done in a variety of ways. The, the rubric of mindfulness, one of them. 
These are traditional human forms. They are human forms that you find in, in, in every culture. Sometimes it, looks like, sometimes it looks like drumming. Sometimes it looks like dancing. Sometimes it looks like singing. Sometimes it looks like sitting still. You, you know, like, I'm, you know, like, a, I'm, a, a, I'm a, like a, a white guy in his 50s telling certain people, I want you to close your eyes and not speak. I can imagine the response being like, I've been told no one's listened to my voice, and I've been silenced all my life. The last thing I'm going to listen to you is close my eyes and be quiet. It's like what, what, where the, the question really is, is like how can we find each other in ways such that we can support each other's examination of that interiority so we can find relationship in and amongst. And, we, and this is true across all traditions. Everywhere I go, it's like, you know, like after this thing, it's like, yeah, but it's really Buddhist, right? It's like, what? No. Not that it's not, like, not like it couldn't be, but it's not, it's got nothing, it's not, it's not inherently, there's a creative, the creativeness is not. And this, it, this creates opportunity to explore different ways of knowing. This is the kind of cool epistemology of this. This is what Arthur has written so much about. This actually changes the way we know. We come to know things. This is where it gets a little kind of woo wee. <laughs> we, co we come to know ourselves and the ways in which you and I are connected in a different sort of a way. Let me just give you one example. Just, just one, just like the... Um, uh, I, in my, in, my, in my economics class, I teach something about positional concerns. That is to say, like how, how my utility is, 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 is related to your utility. And I, you know, and the, and the, in these traditional models, the, as someone else gains something, I'm harmed by that because I'm always in relation to you. So, and then, and then this, this informally in the utility function, the individuals, what the individual has is relative to some mean of the, the society at large. So if that society at large rises, any rise I would get would be kind of divvied away in terms of my, my utility. And they see that, and, I, and they, they kind of, I can give an, I quickly give an example. I say, you know, um, since the, the trustee Bellick here was, has been so generous, he's also given me a bunch of money to give out to everyone. To, so I'm going to give everyone, everyone some money. So I give, I give, I'd say, you know, here's, it turns out I can give everybody $20. So I give you $20, $20, $20, $20, and I give you five, and I give you 20, 20, 20, 20, and, I, and you, and you, after the, after my talk, you come up and say, I think there was some kind of mistake. Because I, I think if, I got five. And he, no, he didn't come today expecting anything. But I say, no, I meant to give you five. This moment, everyone can sort of get a sense like that would be something odd about that. Now, maybe not, you know, it's because he's done a lot of practice and so he's, you know, <laughs> elevated and so he's like, he's like, now I feel just fine. I feel, I feel compassion for everyone else. In fact, I'd give my five away. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a so, so I, you know, it's, we say that and then. Um, I, 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 you know, we, we work on that, and then, uh, then totally uh, on another time, I, I have students um, allocate some money to, to individuals. So I say, suppose that we, suppose we give these different scenarios. And I say, suppose we take the class. The class is usually about 70 students. So you can split the class in half, group A and group B. You're in group A, and group B is going to be asked to go into another room. They don't know what's going to happen. They go into another room. They're going to watch a film or something like that. And now the rest of you in group A is given this choice. You're given a choice that everyone in group A can receive $100, and everyone in group B can receive $100. Or everyone in group A, and remember you're in group A, can receive $100. Or everyone in group B can receive $200. Okay? So then I, yeah, and what, what would you do? All right? I know what you'd do. Yeah, so, so he done this a gazillion times, and all the you know, we want to take a guess what the 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 the, the, the this, these are econ students. Um, what 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 do they what do they what do you think they choose? The first one or the second one? They choose the first one. Sixty five seventy percent choose the first one, not the second one. Recognizing, of course, in each case they receive the hundred, and they have elaborate reasons why they wouldn't give the extra hundred. And then about several weeks later, 
out of nowhere, I say, okay, let's, yeah, we've been doing other kinds of things. We've been doing wishing well exercises. I say, and you might want to try this. Go, imagine, imagine someone for whom you have a lot of gratitude. Okay? Imagine someone for whom you have a lot of gratitude. And imagine that you're in a, in a, in a room with a, um, a one-way mirror. I think that's the one where you can see in, but they can see a mirror. I guess two-way would be just glass or something like that. So, so one-way one mirror. Like this. So you can, see, you can see in the room, but they can, when they look, in, they look, they look at, at the, the, the window, they see a mirror. Okay? So they're, they're in the room, and they're looking at themselves in the mirror. You're looking at them. Right? And they can't hear you. They won't know, but wish them well. They want to try this. Give, take a moment to like, imagine someone for whom you are grateful and you, you, and you never really have to, you never have to say these things if you don't want to, but you can say them right now. The person's just looking at you, although they don't know that they're looking at you. So students do this. And then they say, remember that allocation we did a couple weeks ago? Where group A and group B? Imagine now that everyone's person that they're grateful for is, is group B. Now, how would you like to divvy the money? 100% second choice. And there's, there's a kind of silence that happens. And one person raises their hand and says, do you mean sometimes I, wait, <laughs> they're, 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 they say, but, so, do, sometimes when someone gets a benefit, I'm harmed, but sometimes actually is beneficial to me. Yeah. The other person says, can we, they didn't use, they don't, can, can we, they don't use the word cultivate, but that, can you cultivate that? Then they start to, then they, the immediate question is, they immediately start to think, who are my Joneses? So the next paper we write about is who are our Joneses? Because they recognize what, what, what does that? What, what, is, what is generosity? What is compassion? What, does, what is that? So we started from a place where every student was kind of like, yes, when someone else has a benefit, I'm harmed. And how different that process is from a lecture in which I could say, sometimes you're helped by, by helping someone, sometimes you're hurt, and sometimes it's indifferent. And you write, sometimes helped. Sometimes hurts, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> Whereas the students actually experience a sense of like they chose not to give their own classmates the extra hundred, and now they to totally would, even though the, even though and then and some of them say, well, it's just strategic altruism, right? I'm going to help them, and they said, but this, the person never knows where the hundred dollars comes from. So these exercises can, in fact, initiate that a way that they can rethink what they're learning. In other words, they see the analytic paper on utility, the utility function and positional concerns differently. But more than that, they reflect about their own relationships with other human beings. What, are, what is my relationship to other human beings? They do that from themselves, not from me. The, the exercise itself initiates an internal, this is an example of that internal exploration, which affects interpersonal, which affects systemic. So there's ex these examples, these can be powerful tools for that examination. So this is just a quick, I mean, I think this is what I've been saying, basically. This is what we need to do. And, and, and Harry, look at this, this, I love his face. They just, like, this is what we need to be doing. Our fundamental job is help them grow up. To provide ways in which, and how do we do that? We do that not by telling them stuff. We give them the tools for them to explore and support a process for their exploration that enables a, a greater sense of connection and systemic awareness. 
So this process of contemplative education provides these means. It, provides, it, it supports attention of oneself, of the relationships between ourselves, and systems. That seems like a pretty good thing. It helps students understand their texts in ways I just gave an example of. It cultivates this greater connection and compassion. You know, it doesn't necessarily, it's not just like closing your eyes and you'll feel more compassion for each other. I'm not saying that. I'm not a crazy person, right? It's not like you're, just, you're, like you're just gonna, you can close your eyes, meditate for a little bit, and everything's gonna be fine now. That's not the case. But it, but it can, it can cultivate, why? How can it cultivate that? It can cultivate that with intention. That's part of the, res the research agenda. The research agenda is around cultivate. How do we, the part of the agenda is what are the intentions we want for our students? If part of that, part of that agenda needs to be compassion, connection, difference, examination of implicit and explicit biases, which help us support creativity, problem solving, you know, the engagement and this, you know, the sustained engaged action. So in terms of, which I've been asked to talk about, which I haven't really done yet, <laughs> the, which, <laughs> I had to Google research agenda before I, when I, I thought, exactly. I know how to do like an econ, you know, write, write a grant for my economic history papers, but I wasn't quite sure about this, so. So I think the first question is like, how do we, how do we, how do, what does it mean? We want to teach the whole student. What are we talking about? The first and foremost is, what is our intention? To have a research agenda without a clear intention is absurd. And for us to really, really engage deeply into the intention of our agenda, and I would recommend very powerfully that that agenda include a kind of sense of like Brene Brown's kind of like wholeheartedness. A wholeheartedness in terms of like a wholeheartedness around what, of, of what we're doing and how it affects not only other human beings, but all beings. The planet. We need to think about that. We need to think about that, and we need to have, we, we, we need to have that in, because what we are doing is affecting the planet. Not like, that's, you know, the, all things are connected used to be, for me, kind of like a, a metaphysical concept. It's a physical concept. I mean, that dam in China actually did change, it did. I, it, you can look it up in Snopes or Snoops or whatever that is. You know, it actually changed the, the axis of the planet. Dude. We, I mean, we, that we, like, we, are, we are impacting in, in a powerful way. So it's like, how can we support the whole student? One of the ways I believe we can do that is through these means, which we'll see today. So the first, the first question in terms of a, a real research agenda is this. Getting powerfully clear about what is the difference between student outcomes and student outcomes? Because those outcomes will be relational. They will include ourselves. On our syllabi should be our outcomes. I'm not involved. I'm just a... Uh, it's all about the students, and I'm just here unaffected by my interactions with you. That's absurd. So what is, what, how can we support the whole student through, that's the, so the first question is about intention, in clarifying the clear intention of how we can make for a thriving student body, faculty, staff, administration, institution. It's about institutional cultural change. This research agenda should have that at, 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 its, at its base. What is, how do we make these institutions the place for this kind of inquiry and sustained inquiry that makes this kind of change for engaged action? So 
So that's what I just said. <laughs> this is huge. In all our classes, in all our interactions, in our, in our cafeteria, what is, what, is, what is meaning? What is meaningful? How do, we, how, do we, how do we spark and sustain an examination of what's deeply meaningful? The scientists are crying out for this. You talk to people on the cutting edge, cutting, cutting edge of genetic research, they're saying, you don't seem to realize, we need, we need someone here who does ethics. We are moving so fast, and it's powerful what they're doing. Beautiful what they're doing, and they themselves are saying, I mean, I, my, I know someone who's in a PhD program, that's what he wants to do. He's like, oh, he's, oh my goodness, what I am being trained to do, powerful. And I think somebody should be thinking about this. We need to do that. Not, I'm not saying we should, we should be the arbiters of what's meaningful and not meaningful. But we should be conducting, way, conducting a, the ways in which and providing the tools for students to, to initiate and sustain that inquiry into their own ethical development, what's meaningful, and how they can use that as their own intentionality to live congruent action within that. The, re the research agendas should be based on that. What are, how, how, how is this fostered? And that's about longitudinal, more longitudinal studies, obviously. Because indeed, that's what this is about. These institutions are agents of change. They can be agents just of you know, just perpetration. Right? They can just replicate whatever there is. But they, we can be powerful agents of change. And I think the ways in which these practices, which we'll see throughout this, throughout this day and in a variety of other ways, are ways in which we can foster these elements such that we can create an agenda to demonstrate the ways in which we can make these changes. And that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. So we totally have to do this. We totally have to do this. Everybody gets to do this once. We just take turns giving the talk, and then everybody claps. It really is nice. It's so nice. God. So there's some time. I've come in right, on time, right? So I, there, there's, right? She's so organized. And I'm so not organized. I always feel like such a schlub around her. Like she sent me, she sent me an agenda. My talk began, I swear to you, my talk began at 9.37. And I thought, by God, my talk is gonna begin at 9.37. Approximate, yeah, appro approximate 9.37. So are there, would, would you like to ask any questions? Yeah. Uh, can you tell us in some examples what you think are the best uh, programs supporting that agenda at universities in the U.S.? Could you say that question again? I'm sorry. Sure. Do you have any examples of some of the best programs at universities in the U.S. that support that type of agenda? Oh, that's great. Thank you for that question. Yeah, there are a variety of places that are doing this kind of work. Like, there's, there's, so there's like the, the Brown University has a contemplative studies department, as you probably well know. The University of Pennsylvania 
um, you ever, no, the University of Indiana in Pennsylvania has living communities that are actually based around these kinds of these kinds of processes. That U Penn has a, a place. Uh, George Washington has a place. Uh, there's uh, at Duke. There's a ver there a, there are many 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 organizations that are trying. They're they're incorporate. I'm sorry, there's a light right there. So I'm sorry, I want to see you. So if you're wondering what I'm doing, like I'm sending you energy or something like that. I, I just I just just trying to not be blinded by this light. Um, that there there are a variety of places. And if seriously, on, on our website. Uh, that at, at the Center for Contemplative Mind, we have a number of places that, that we can give you. And if you have specific questions, seriously, if specific questions around, I'm really interested in this aspect of what's being done well, um, Carrie Bergman, where, Carrie, are you back there? Carrie right there knows a lot about the, the, our, our association. The association has about 800 members for the center. I would highly recommend you become a member. So, uh, but, but I won't proselytize right now. But, but, it, but it, it, so that, that, that's one of the places where you can call, it's a real hub for the kind of work. So if you're interested in particular kind of work, we can really direct you to places that are working in, in different areas. Thank you. Of course. Yes. Thank you. This astounding and very provocative talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, you talked about outcomes and outcomes. Yes. And, uh, but you started off by showing us the level of distress yes. that students have. Yes. Uh, and I would also argue that it's... You talked about um, outcomes and then the big outcomes that we'd be interested in as educators or for our students. Yeah. And then the level of distress that you, the early slide from the UCLA study that you showed that the students come in with. And I would say that uh, mirrors the level of distress that the faculty yes. have for sure. Um, yes. And just how, how do you get to that, uh, how do you carry out that agenda uh, at the same time addressing this? I mean, it seems like fundamentally you have to address this level of distress up yeah. front right away. It's a really good question. I mean, so that, I mean, I, that, that's part of, like, in terms of our, what I meant by outcomes, that's part of what this course is about. I, that, I, do, I do another kind of workshop around intentionality. And, like, and really a lot of our intentionality is about I want to foster love and peace. So like, seriously, you know, it's like, when, so when we create our syllabi, when we create our, when we create our assignments, like going back to what's fundamental, like how, what, is, what is this doing for the well-being of my students? Do you know what I mean? So that, I think part, part of that, what I meant by outcomes, is that one of the outcomes we want to do is we want to foster a sense of flourishing in our students. How does my course, I'm serious, how does my course in an introduction to economics foster that sense? You know, while, while hold, yes, I'm giving an exam that causes, there, there might be anxiety. How do I hold that in a way that can foster a sense of well-being? That's part of what I'm talking about. We need, and we need that, you hit nail on head. It's not kind of like, I'm all done, actualized. I'm like, you know, there's a, there's a, like I'm, you know, I'm, so like, I'm, I'm all done. How do, we, how do we do that for ourselves ongoingly? Get, how do you do that? By creating... By, by creating contact amongst ourselves. We, we're so isolated. Our students are lonely. Why wouldn't they be? How do we act? Right? We're, we're, it's a very monastic kind of old, you know. I, went, I once had a, I once had a, um, a fellowship in, in Italy, and I swear my, we were in an old but, uh, a monastery. And my, my office was a cell, a monk cell. And I thought, this is perfect metaphor, right? It's a perfect metaphor. And I went in there and closed the door. <laughs> I did. I did. Not anymore. Yeah. Are you familiar with the um, whole child approach to education, not in higher ed, but in uh, public school settings, et cetera? Yeah, oh, oh, yes, in, a, in, 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 a, in, a, in the broadest sense, not as, not as any kind of expert, yes. So in Buffalo Public Schools, we've... Excellent. We've really yes. set the bar for urban education with this approach. So how, how then do you see the link between what we're doing, all of higher ed's future students, and, and what higher ed is trying to do? Oh, yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you. I spent most of my, seriously, under elementary school years against a wall, or in a hall. 
<laughs> and then it's, it's kind of funny in one way. It was trauma for me. I, seriously, when, when I was in third grade, they, they gave us a kind of like ersatz IQ test. I was educably mentally handicapped. Seriously, that's what she told me. I can still feel it in my body. So what you're doing is profoundly linked, essential. And we have gotten it wrong. We've spent so much, we're spending money. We've spent, we've inverted the kind of spending. All, all, all the Heckman numbers, everything about like early, where should we be putting all our money? Zero to three years, probably, right? And then from zero to, from three to eight, that much more. We, but yet we, we put it all over here. Now I understand research is very important, but way underfunded, way, and it's, you know, and there's a, there's a whole gen, there's a whole, fem, there's obviously why this is occurring in terms of the systemic problems, in terms of the kind of sexism and so what, and how it's being paid and so forth. So what you're doing is net profoundly. We, you know, seriously, we have to work together. I know this is, I can't, let's talk, I'm, this is, a, you might think of like, oh, you deflected that question. That is a, that is the right question. We need to do that. Because this, what I'm talking about, doesn't just happen when you're, you become 18. In fact, it's often, it's, there's too much, there, there's so much gobbledygook that it, that, to un, like when I, by the time I got to 18, when I was 18, I was here, but yeah, I'm still, I, I, I'm not kidding, I wanted to run out, the, run out of here. I want still to run out of here. <laughs> yeah, it's like dealing with, you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna, don't worry, it's not gonna become like a, like a, you're thinking like, oh God, please don't become a, you know, a, a therapeutic session. Cure me of my trauma. But it's like, that, that we have to work together. It's, it is one, it's, it's, it's uh, thank you, which is, not, which is not in this research agenda. <laughs> you probably will talk about it much more. But like that's, that ter in terms of that's another piece. Thank you. Exactly. It's like, well, how do we work across? And, you know, not only, uh, not only cross, cross, the, cross from, from, you know, from, from, you know, preschool to, through, the, through all the levels of education, but different modalities. Maybe you're not using, maybe you wouldn't call yourself mindfulness or, you know, com contemplative, but we're, we're working in the same kind of modalities. Let's talk to one another. We need places like this. So this, so what you've done today is profound, profound to have these moments that can now live in ways that can engender ways in which we can now work together. I will seek you out. I hope you will seek me out. And we can start to work together. And, and selling it, selling it is around showing effectiveness. That's, that is the research agenda. You, well, that's, that, that's what this, that's what that's, I know, I know it is, I know it is, but it starts somewhere, and there, there will be research shown here today. So as long as we can get the agendas, we, we start with the agenda, and start with the sense of like the importance of it, and like the, the fire in you, I can see it, the kind of both anger and, quite frankly, and, and, uh, and, 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 and fire. That place, we, we, we take that, that will make a difference. It will start to make a difference, and we, that's where it starts, with an agenda, we, we, we can make this happen. Seriously. I believe that. I believe that. And it starts in places like this. This is why we, you know, you think like, why would you bring all these people together? I have to drive six hours to come here to talk to you for an hour. It seems stupid. But it's not because there are moments like this. Thank you. Again, thank you for your work. Twenty-four hours ago, I was in Costa Rica. You were in Costa Rica. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm just so moved by this. I was, in a, I was at many city schools, and the number of schools in that country that are practicing mindfulness is mind-boggling. I went in there to explore education in the country to see what we could do at our university with those schools. Every one of them, from the, I would say the privileged to the poorest schools, have some element of mindfulness or exploration of mindfulness. Mm. The SEPIA program, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a program for the community. 
It's psychological support, legal support, family support. And as we're talking, she's talking about mindfulness. Like, oh my gosh, we don't own it. It's everywhere. And I was just completely blown away yeah. by the fact that we're all in this together. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> if I can just follow up for a second. Um, my colleague uh, just put the personal touch on it, as you did a minute ago by talking about driving the six hours to have this moment. Yeah. You could have stayed there and done this online. It wouldn't have been the same. And I'd like, I you, to that. I'd like you to speak to that point, please. Oh, well, I, you'd like to be to speak to that point? <laughs> it's like a weird parlor game. <laughs> I want you to talk about this. Okay. Here, here's what I would say, because now you put me on this particular spot. <laughs> this, the, the, the space created in and amongst is real. There's a living energy. I don't know how else to speak of it. There's a way in which when we're in our, when we're, <laughs> I can feel that. There's something created. The, we're embodied creatures. And they, when we're together, we share that energy. That is the kind of the, the second person perspective Terry and others have, have really worked on in ways I'm, I'm, I'm being cautious around speaking about it because I have not done a lot of work in the classroom around this aspect, but I've read your work and it's profound. It makes a difference. It makes a big difference. And that lived sense, just to read, like that, the sense of like what's actually happening Softness, fear, anxiety, love, all of that that's occurring, and then responding in ways that are meaningful. Good teachers do that. I mean, it's part of like, like why protocols are dangerous with respect to mindfulness or teaching, right? Because it's like, I can give you the protocol, you can read the protocol, and if you're not in it, it ain't gonna happen. You know, people want like, oh, give me your exercise and I'll do it. It's like, yeah, you can do that. But if I, I can do the exercise one day and I'm just like gone, I'm too anxious to the effect of my past trauma, nothing. And I think that's the difference. It's a real powerful lived sense of embodied beings together. And have you ever been intimate with anyone? Boom. What that is. Other questions? Yeah. It's a marvelous presentation. Thank you very much. I'm glad you just got to be making it happen. But my question to you, though, is that most of us, whether we're faculty, staff, administrators, students, operate in an environment whose value, whose power structure, whose incentive. Yeah. Yeah. We are, we, we, and and the, the, uh, this is a great, this is a wonderful counter to that unfortunate environment. But nonetheless, this is a moment. After we leave this moment or these moments, <laughs> we will go back to the real world. And the whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There, that's right. I'm going to stop you there. This is a real world. I'm going to, wait, 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 wait. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, <laughs> you know, I do. I do. But that's a real question. That is a real question. That is a real powerful question. That is a real question. It's a question that I that I've heard here too. Like that that, that I don't know. What is your name? Sue. Sue. I've heard it in Sue's question. It is by by increment. It is and it requires unbelievable fire intentionality 
and follow through. There she sits. Lisa Nepal. Seriously. 14 hour days. Un seriously, when I say you know, people use the word unbelievable, you know, like, like it just as a word, throw away words. I mean, I cannot believe what she did. So it, requ it requires it. Yeah, and we can't, and like to foster that in, li in our little ways. You're right. We, we, like, how do, you, how, how do we have cultural change? We have individuals who are deeply committed and follow through. Who, in fact, like you're, you're probably a pretty busy guy, it sounds like to me, handled when he said, when, he, when you stood here and said, and I handled the park, and she, she kind of he joked, and parking a week ago. What I got is, wait a second, this guy actually followed through within one week, making sure we all could park. Thank you. <laughs> That's how it happens. Like those little steps. So it, but it begins with intention. Intention and a practice that can initiate that intention and sustain that intention in our work. It's a great question. And may, may it continue? Because this is, this, this is real. This is the real world. This is an academic conference. This is something else. It's like, oh, thank God. There's been so many academic conferences. I'm glad we went to that one where we just kind of felt good all day. <laughs> this, this is how it happens. We are having an academic conference. This is an, this, we are being academics together. Not like it's academic. Last question. Oh, it's, Thank you for the talk. And I just want to make a comment. It's not a question. Okay. Um, the gentleman over there asked the question about how we do this when we go out. When we do our meditations over at Stony Brook, we always tell the students to congratulate themselves for just being there for showing up, and that's what you have to do. <laughs> you have to show up every day. But also, don't wait for congratulation. Be able to congratulate yourself. People who work with emotions, you use a sort of a commodity that you don't see as important. But mental health workers, teachers, doctors, nurses, that work and take care of other people, you use emotions. That's your commodity, and you know you have to fill yourself up to get more of it, and you have to fill yourself up with congratulating yourself every day. Huh. Thank you. <laughs>